How's Dave been? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> How is your day been? How are you? I'm good. Good. Good, good, good. Um, so I understand that you have been uh, arrived at the lake. You weren't arrested on arrival. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, we both know some people tried to throw a monkey wrench in my operation. <laughs> And they were they were shown that not only was it legal for me to be here, yeah, you know, well exactly, and and good on well, the um, get on uh, the chap from Crash Course Saturday, who stood their ground and um, and told the truth. But had a very busy Saturday and Sunday. Saturday, I went from Sarasota, Florida, to Atlanta, Georgia. Then Atlanta, Georgia, to Detroit, Michigan, and then wow. from Detroit, Michigan, to Burlington, Vermont. That's um. So that was Saturday. It was that about six hours flying? Seven or eight. Seven or eight. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, the next day, me, Carrick Saint Laurent, who's producing this documentary called "Release the Bodet Film," primarily oh, yeah. about the Bodet Film, but about the champ phenomena in general in other parts of the video. Uh -huh. Him, myself, Jeremy Sanborn, which you will probably know from the On the Trail of Champ miniseries by That's Stomp right. Town Monsters. The, the diver. The diver, yes. Mm. And his brother, Ryan, who's uh -huh. also a diver. So the four of us made the the... Champ's Greatest Hits Tour. Awesome. First, we went to All Sable, New York, where the Bodette video was filmed. They dived over there, and Carrick interviewed me on the beach. So we were right there where the video happened, on the, awesome. on the beach next to the river. And you could even see the buoy that is near where it was filmed from the beach. So we went from there to the extreme north end of Lake Champlain to a place called Alberg. Now, are you familiar with the study that Chris Oric and Dick Rayner did on the Mansi photograph? Not that one. No, no, I'm not. About four or five years ago. Oh, is this the one where they actually matched up the landscape pretty, yes. pretty yes. neatly? With, with how it would have been okay. uh, back then today, That's I'm sure. We meant, the yeah. location that they had picked yeah. out. Unfortunately, Chris Ork has passed away. He passed away from cancer. Mm. But um, Dick wrote a paper about it about three or four years ago. So it is considered probably to be the best possible site at this point in time mm -hmm. last year i was contacted by a man that lives in st albans vermont who drives past this place in st albans bay where you can see a beach in the background and he thinks this looks like the location of the manzi photograph mm -hmm. Last year, I went up to investigate that site, too. So that's a potential also ran. Wow. Um, Sandra Manzi herself was kind of vague about the exact location. She said she was north of St. Albans. Mm -hmm. And then in an interview that John Kirk saw, she mentioned North Hero. Mm -hmm. Where this site is that Dick and Chris Oric picked out is right near a bridge that goes from Alberg to North Hero. Uh huh. Okay. So, you know, there's all sorts of speculation. Yeah. I will go on record as saying that I believe that Sandra Manzi and her family are telling the truth and that they probably saw an animal. Yeah, I always believe the same thing. You know, thing about her testimony. I don't mean to knock. The um, the log theory. I mean, if you don't believe that there is a creature in Lake Champlain, mm -hmm. 
that looks like a plesiosaur, this log idea makes a lot of sense. Is this one of these situations, Scott, though, where um, like the same thing that, that Roland talks about a lot, the my theory sucks the least theory? Yeah, you where know. Where essentially but interposing some log that fooled a woman and her family. That I, was knew, a, a, I knew Sam DeMancy. She was a friend of mine. Yeah. I know the kids. Yeah. You yeah. know, so. Well, I, I always believed her, her testimony. and I've, Yeah. Don't know it to be true, but sometimes you just get a feeling for people. They and I think an animal, and I see no reason yeah. not to believe them because the object in the photograph to me looks like an animal. Here's a question: Was the phenomenon very well known at that time that she took the photograph? Was it seventy six? She well, took it, or was it was had it died down at that point? So well, could it be argued that it's very interesting that you know Sandra Mansi. Her photograph, she claimed, was taken in 1977. Oh, 77. Yeah. But not revealed to, to the media and the world uh -huh. until 1980, 81. Okay, so 1978, National uh, no, Reader's Digest uh -huh. have a major article about the Lake Champlain monster okay. in their magazine. So this is before... The Manzi photograph was released. Okay. And there's another magazine, popular in New England, called Yankee Magazine. They had an article about Champ in 1977. Uh-huh. So, you know, Champ was in the national consciousness, okay. but, but just not as prominent as the Loch Ness Monster. Yeah. It's not when something... When the Manzi photograph was released... Yeah. It was a brief period where interest in Champ actually eclipsed the Loch Ness monster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I heard that. So, um, you know, but it's all relative. You could say, for example, that somebody like Sandra Mansi driving around the Lake Champlain with her family would not have had Champ on the brain, essentially. Not like somebody driving around Loch Ness would have Nessie on the brain, regardless of who you are from any part yeah, of the world. Yeah, no, no, they are. That was the furthest thing from their minds, is mm. my understanding. Yeah. yeah. But I would I, point out, Sandra Manzi is from this area. New Hampshire? From, New Hampshire, is that she's right? She's from Vermont. Vermont, okay. So. Yeah. She's from, um, she lived in Bristol before she died, uh -huh. and I think she's probably from somewhere in that region. I don't remember exactly. Okay. okay but that's she's buried up in northern Vermont, where her family came from. Wow. So, um, where was I going with this? Well, um, it was um, the, the, the journey. Uh, yeah. Apart from the boated film, you yeah. investigated okay, so we some went, of the other we sightings. From, yeah. We went from the mouth of the Al Sable River in New York State uh -huh. to Alberg, Vermont, and the bridge that goes from Alberg to North Hero, which is a spot that Chris Ork. And Dick think that the photograph was taken. Uh -huh. Right next door to a house that's in front of where the monster was supposed to be, according to their calculations, is a fishing lodge mm -hmm. called the Holiday Harbor Inn. Mm -hmm. And I've been by there. I've made four or five trips up there trying to investigate this site, right? And a couple of the times that I went up there, I spoke to the people in the inn. So we went in to get their permission to walk out on their dock and mm -hmm. film the place next door where the monster was supposed to have been. And the guy's wife had a champ sighting. Wow. And Tarek inter wound up interviewing her for the documentary. This is a fresh sighting, unreported. Yeah. Wonderful. So that's going to be on there too. That's wonderful. And uh, Carrick is supposed to do an interview with Kia Warren, who is Sandra's granddaughter. Uh -huh. And her mother would be Heidi, of Larry and Heidi, the kids that were uh -huh. told to get out of the water. <laughs> That's them. I know them. Did the kids remember seeing the animal also? Well, I I'm not at liberty to say. Okay. Let me just put it out. 
Okay. Okay. To protect their privacy and, and everything I else. Understand. But out. I mean, I would imagine that children, um, those children would have seen all kinds of harassment and denigration over the years directed if, towards the mother, and well, they I believe probably the quite. Mother, yeah. Mother tried to protect them from that, and yeah. she got a lot of harassment and mm. treatment over the years. So I think that's why she wanted to protect them. Yeah. From that. In Vermont, so, this is a very rural area as well. I would encourage them to come forward yeah. with their account of what they think happened if they're comfortable with doing that. But that's yeah. up to them. I don't want to invade their privacy or whatever, but I, I respect that, you know? People often ask me, Scott, they say, um, you know, do you wish that you could have a sighting? Do you wish you could photograph or film a sighting? And I tell them that I used to. But oftentimes these days, especially now doing what I do, um, I don't think it would help me. If anything, <laughs> it would cause me a lot of, or I want one, of course, but it would cause me a lot of harassment that um, wouldn't go away. And, you know, essentially your character is up for, uh, for assassination as soon as you have one of these sightings. And I often wonder if many witnesses don't come forward in all spectrums of cryptozoology because of that because they see what happens to other people when they come forward they yeah, don't want to take that chance to say well they i do. saw it i'll Some keep people it to myself want to avoid that whole controversy mm. yeah and as a result there may be important data that really we don't so. have access to because people don't want to talk about it i really think because so. they don't want to be put under the spotlight yeah, and in a rural place like Vermont, even with the the story of the monster, I'm sure, I'm sure people think less of you when you report. Well, you got to think. There's people that have lived their whole life around the lake that have never seen anything. Mm -hmm. So how could it be there? And then there are people that have lived most of their life, or lived their whole life around life around the lake. Maybe went forty, fifty years and never saw anything. Mm -hmm then saw something and haven't seen it again for 30 or 40 years. Yeah. So these things happen, you know? Let's talk about and your that's journey. One, that's one reason I'm skeptical of these investigators that claim, oh, I've seen Champ 19 times. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, right. Well, I, I often... But the one thing about... Um, I'm not calling anybody a liar, but it, when we're talking about people who fabricate things, the one thing about liars who get away with things once or twice is it emboldens them. And when they become when they become emboldened, they make mistakes. And that's normally doubling down. It's normally magnifying the lie or multiplying the lie. Um, somebody told well, me once before. A lot of people see things and make mistakes. You know, they see yeah. boat wakes, standing mm -hmm. waves, floating yeah. logs, oh. large surgeons. It happens. And, in a place like Loch Ness, for example, which you're probably very uh, more than aware of, that the loch is actually so narrow comparatively to Lake Champlain that when the big passenger boat goes goes through one of the cruises, that wake, I mean that, but sorry, it's that, like a pool um, type. It can it can keep going for about five minutes. I watched it from a from a, the the, yeah. the hillside from the Great Glen Highway. I watched the boat take off, and I stayed there for five minutes, and it was still you know undulating. The whole time, yeah, and um, you know, I think that's just something that um, mercenary, opportunistic individuals photograph from time to time. Just the same as in Lake Okanagan, it's always a standing wave, isn't it? Yes. And yet, you push that to the papers, everybody gets excited. My favorite Loch Ness one at the moment is the fireman who didn't believe in it and can't believe he photographed it, and neither can anybody else. There's nothing in the frame. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Have you seen this one? It's, I believe um, I have. It's insane. I mean, there's a red circle with it, so at least you can imagine where it would be. <laughs> it there is some evidence that might be of a champ or might be of a Nessie, but it's so ambiguous. Yeah. It's worthless as evidence because you it's can't worthless. decide whether it's a hump mm. or if it's the dark crest of a wave. I mean, there's no way of knowing. If so you some... might as well throw it in the garbage. This is this is the truth. And if something like the um, the Sturgeon's photo, for example, um, which was very clear, I know it's 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 
highly likely to be a, a fraud or fake. And I, I talked to Roland, he thinks the same thing. And I'm coming around to that slowly but surely, being a diehard believer. I'm starting to say, well, yeah, it looks like it was. Anyway, if that was debated, and it seemed very clear the pictures for however many years, nearly 80 years, and if the Palace and Gimlin footage is still debated hotly, and these things are very, very clear, anything less than those things is nothing at all. Yeah. I mean, the Baudet film, the, um, the... Are you familiar with the Ian Milne sighting at Loch Ness in 1930? Is that a film sighting? No, no. it wasn't a... It was just an eyewitness sighting, but this is three years before... Oh, I'm sure. Aldi it's a... McKay sighting. Oh, okay, the McKay the sighting, sighting, yes. In 1930. Yes, the, the, the McKay sighting, yes. Um, but well, the point the... I'm trying to make is that this summer, the Ian Milne sighting will be 90 years old. Wow. Wow. And so as you've seen in three years, Aldi McKay sighting will be 90 years old. And the uh, Loch Ness monster phenomenon, as we know it, will officially be 90 years old. And where are we? I mean, where are we? I mean, it's, I think, you know what, it's very simple for people, especially looking in a, in a finite body of water to say, you should have found something right now, but water is so hard to investigate. Yeah. Um, and if an animal is elusive, if an animal is primarily nocturnal, for example, or has some ability, as we've discussed, to stay submerged for long periods of time. Yeah. What hope is there in, in locating anything without really military-style technology being employed uh, in the field to investigate well, I mean, you can sink the Eiffel Tower in Loch Ness. It's 750 feet deep. Oh, yeah, sure you could. I That's thought... a lot of water, yeah. 24 miles, but 750 feet deep. Lake yeah. Champlain is half that depth at its uh -huh. maximum depth, but it's five times longer than Loch Ness. Yeah. What is the length? 114 or 121 miles? I always forget. 129 as far as I know. Okay. And 14 miles at its widest, right? About 11 miles. 11, okay. Because the ferry that goes from Burlington to Port Kent uh -huh. goes that route. It takes an hour to get across. Wow. I mean, that's when I was there, I was just impressed by what a huge body for what it it was and it just seemed like a sea from certain vantage points you looked out well yeah and you couldn't see the other side you were looking at a sea well, yeah we were you know me and me and will out on the boat out in the middle of lake mm. champlain you'd think you're on the ocean yeah yeah really yeah. fantastic so i mean we've talked about this before but just for anybody listening again you know, you're there at the lake you've got your dinghy at the moment you've got your your um your bio darts, you've got sonar, yep. you've got a drone now. Where would you, what types of, I won't ask you for the locations, but what types of areas are you looking to investigate? What are you hoping to, well, to capture Well, I'm that? trying to go to places where I've got access to deep water mm -hmm. right off the shoreline. Uh -huh. And the reason why is that I don't want to get out in the middle of Lake Champlain in this raft mm. and be at the mercy of big waves and everything out in the middle of the lake. It's no. dangerous. Of course. I don't know if you heard about this, but I had a friend named Jeff Stentz who was a fishing guide on Lake Michigan. A few months back, he was drowned in a wow. boating accident on Lake no. Michigan. So, you know, on, on, on the hails of that, uh -huh. and having been out on Lake Champlain in a big boat and seen what the waves can do out there, I'm yeah. trying to be extremely careful. I mean, I always wear a life jacket when I'm out in uh -huh. the boat. I don't care how big the boat is. I'm not going to drown if I can help it. No, absolutely. I, I, I'm so, exactly the same. So this is weird, but I'm taking this sonar unit and putting it on a raft. I bought brackets uh -huh. that are made to mount this kind of sonar onto a raft or an inflatable boat. Wow. So I've got the fun task of putting all this stuff together over the next three or four days, which I'm dreading, actually. Well, but nobody else is going to do it, so no. I have to do it. If, 
if if it was me, I'm very I'm not very handy. If it was me, then someone would would sink in the lake on the first day if I attached it to the rock. Well, I'm probably you know I'm not mechanically inclined, so I'm probably mm. going to have to to work on it a little bit, then run screaming from the room, have a cigarette, and then come back to it. You a could get drunk and hope you wake up in the morning with it with it finished. <laughs> Let me tell you, this drone which was a gift from a dear friend of mine named Chris mm-hmm. Jones. You probably okay. know him, too. Yeah, yeah. So Chris bought me this drone, and the entire instruction manual is in German. Of course. No English, because it came from Germany, which probably explains the price on it. Well, but anyway, well, I, I managed to, to make my way through it. Yeah. Yeah. You so what I had to do last night is I had to download the app to record remotely from the drone from Google Play. And the only thing I had to work with was the name of the app because the rest of the text was in German. Wow. But I found it and I downloaded it and it's working. So the explanation is there in English, I guess. Yeah. yeah I was yeah. going to just, just joke with you slightly that if the instructions are in German, at least you know that even though you can't understand them, they're very precise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even though it's in German. Yeah, it, it astonishes me these days. Actually. No, no, it's when I open German, something, but I just don't speak German. Yeah, you know? no, me neither. I'm not. Um, no, I don't. We did it in high school. <sighs> French and other things, but I, I don't speak German. I know a little French and a little Spanish. That's yeah, about it. Spanish, I'm okay with. I'm not so bad. Yeah. Know a little bit of Hebrew now. Um, uh, but I, I'm never. I'm never in a in a in a situation where I have to fluently talk. Another language. If I, I was, I would probably know it, you know? It would also probably be very rare for you to be in a situation with a German that didn't speak English, oddly. Yeah. Um, and... Well, I have friends from, from all over the world. Mm. I think you know Marcus Hemmler, don't you? Uh, yes. Oh, yes, he does the... He's uh, a good friend uh, of mine. He's he a German. Carcass, he does the... Uh, the yeah, bass and shark carcasses is primarily what he works on. He does very... Carcass. Very scientific, very yeah, he's a great guy, yeah, fantastic, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I'm, I'm really uh wondering about with the whole champ thing and lake monster research in general, it, it was really nice to see people like Carrot, uh, Carrick, and the Crash Course cryptozoology guys getting out there because there's a feeling sometimes that. Um, you know, lake monster hunting is an aging discipline. You know, you yourself have been there for 20 plus years. Everybody at Loch Ness has been there for 50 plus years, it seems. Yeah. Well, is is there anybody new with that kind of generation that will carry on the work when when we can't do it anymore? Yeah. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, just to. to, And I'm hoping that we get to properly mentor the generation that's coming behind us. That would be good. And get rid of the crap, you know, the. The the fighting and the or yeah. whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Hey, look at me. <laughs> I um, I was wondering about that. You know, I did a little clip a little while back, and part of the clip I was saying I was a bit frustrated that day, and we're going without going into any of the details. I was talking about cryptozoology and saying, is the problem really that we're all big fish in a little pond, and there's not anything else to eat other than each other? You know, because um. There's there's not much finance, there's not much uh, money in it, and everybody's trying to grab a bit of the limelight yeah, well, to fund what they're doing usually. And in doing so, it sort of makes people elaborate a little too much on what they've got. Whereas, well, it's it's very insular. Yeah, yeah. There are whole hordes of people all over the earth that don't care anything about cryptozoology. There's tons lot. of them that don't even know what it is. Yeah, exactly. You know. So, well, exactly. That's a very sobering reality if you, mm. you, you know, manage to think outside the box for a little bit. Oh, yeah. I do it all the time. You know, I imagine. At the very least, people can, people can ridicule what I'm doing, but I'm investigating a real phenomenon. Whether these animals exist or not, people really believe in them. Yeah, that's And they right. believe they've seen them. So there's something worthy of investigation going on, even if it's just a sociological, psychological thing. Yeah. So yeah. on that basis alone, it's worthy of investigation. I happen to believe that there's something 
biological behind it. But well, that's you had a sighting of something played, you know? with a, a flipper or a fin-like appendage in the leg, yeah. didn't you? And that was what you say about 15 feet long, or what, what was the, 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 the let's, go, let's go over your sighting again. We've done that a bunch of times, well, but just for people listening. I've likened it to a leatherback turtle, but much uh -huh. larger, about 15 feet long was the visible portion of it. And it was either a, a head on a short neck or a flipper like appendage protruding off the right end of it. And the mm. whole thing swam for a few seconds and then stopped and sank like a rock. Mm. And it was a greeny black color like a leatherback without spots. And what was the location of that? A place called Proctor Shoals. Uh -huh which is about a thousand yards out from a park called Battery Park in Burlington. And is the you're at Battery Park and you look out uh -huh. the view right straight in front of you, you'll see a little island, a rock island called uh -huh. uh, Rock Dunder. My sighting happened to the left of Rock Dunder near a buoy, wow. which sits on top of this Proctor Shoal. There's a shipwreck out there. That's it's a um... barge called the noise i think it sank in 1881 uh -huh. so that's what that buoy is doing out there is to mark that shipwreck that's and, and what exciting happened is the water deep there or we're talking about 100 feet or something like uh that. 60 70 feet deep okay it's still deep enough it's deep enough for something to get in there yeah that's for sure so um yeah. and you, you would you say you say it seemed like a leatherback turtle but was that just the shape that reminded you of it well, or the, the color texture of the skin. Shape. It was a big mound yeah. with a smaller mound looking object in the middle of it. And then it turned, yeah. and that smaller mound like object looked like either a head or a flipper. Okay. The shape when it turned is very much like what you see in the Olsen video. Uh huh. Yeah. And the Olsen video happened not far from where my sighting happened. You go around the corner. From Proctor Show, and you're at Oak Ledge Park. Well, I remember that you you swam out Back. to that cave. Is that right? The last yeah. time you were there, uh, where yeah. the where the Olsen uh, there animal was no cave. seems to disappear. There were just deep rock clefts that oh, looked okay. like a cave from a distance. I I managed to sell that. The only way I could sell it was to get in the water and go down there and physically investigate, which I did last summer. And I've seen the clip, and it's. Yeah. Um, I uh, I did imagine to myself as you were swimming over there that maybe you should have been between two two slices of bread. Or something. Yeah. But that's well, a, a anyway, getting back yeah. to the trip on Sunday, after we left the supposed Manzi site, uh -huh. we went to the Olsen site at Oak Ledge Park. So basically, we bounced all over the top half of Lake Champlain. Uh -huh. You might as well say we covered at least the top half of Lake Champlain in that it's, little triangle. Talking about that 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 type of thing, you being at the top part, the northern part, I'm, I'm getting yeah. here. Um, is there a particular part of the lake that has most of the sightings? Uh, are they often near river mouths? For instance, a lot of the, the loch sightings I know this, are near river mouths. near river mouths. Yeah. Yeah, which would make sense if they're chasing schools of fish. Mm. Mm. Particularly schools of fish that go into the river to spawn, mm. Mm. which would be in the spring and early summer times well, you, of year. It would make sense. Did. The same time people are out on the lake, you know. Oh yes. Well, there's a direct correlation with with Loch Ness. That there's a, a huge percentage of sightings that are not mid Loch or near river mouths. And I think it's the south east end of the lock. I might be wrong. It's in my book. I'll have to check the fact. But there's one side of the lock at the very bottom. I think it's the southeast end that doesn't have any sightings where there's no river. Exactly. Uh, um, and it's it was interesting. When, when I first found that out, I was like, oh, my gosh, look at that. Isn't that odd? And, of course, that makes sense. When I went to Lake Windermere, which is a very small lake in the Lake District in Cumbria, to uh, investigate Bonessy. And there's a, yeah. a whole series of lakes there. Again, most of the sightings were in the northern end of the lake, near the River Rothe, which was uh, there was a, a trout farm, sort of halfway up. A lot of trout came out of the river at that point. 
And it just seemed to suddenly click and make sense. Of course, if we're dealing with an animal. It's going to be well, looking for a, a fresh vantage point to catch fish. If there is a hot spot, and I tell them no. Because mm. there are reports all over the lake, even up in uh -huh. the Canadian Park. You know, so you never know where these things are going to um, show up. Now, Port Henry is heavily invested in promoting Champ as a tourist attraction, which yeah. is fine. Yeah. And there are a lot of sightings of Port Henry, but there are sightings that the original sighting that started, officially started the whole Champ phenomenon, really was in Dresden, New York, just north of Whitehall, mm -hmm. which is where Paul Bartholomew lives. Just as you're going out of Whitehall, if you uh -huh. blink, you'll miss Dresden. I know what that is. Railroad yeah. workers claim to have seen a sea monster there in 1873. Wow. And that's really, if you, if you critically study you know, the, the modern champ phenomenon, that's really where it started. There's this kind of uh, very questionable sighting from Port, from um, Bulwaga Bay in Port Henry from 1819 that clearly sounds like it's spurious. Uh -huh. And then there's a sighting from 1808 with no details. Now, I would give that credence, but unfortunately, it's one sentence that says, a monster has lately been seen in Lake Champlain. Okay. That's all it says, so I, you know, take that from what you want. So and <laughs> the real steady phenomenon has gone from like 1873 to at least 1929. There's yeah. a whole series of newspaper articles, regional newspaper articles here on both the New York State and Vermont that you can look at that go pretty steady up through that period. Mm -hmm. And then something came along in the 1930s to eclipse the fame of Champ. I'm not <laughs> sure what it was, but I suspect it was somewhere in Scotland. Those so, Scots. <laughs> yeah. So then you've got, you've got kind of reports that pick up in like ah, the 1950s that mm. go through the 60s. Phil Raines, who was a communications professor at the University of uh, Plattsburgh, uh, State University of New York at Plattsburgh, started cataloging sightings in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Then Joe Zarzinski came along in the 70s. And Dennis Hall came along 80s and 90s. Okay. And then yours truly showed up in 1994. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, well. And lucky for you that you did. Yeah, because, so um, it's, you know. I think what would you be doing if you hadn't had that sighting, if you hadn't started investigating this phenomenon? Well, if I hadn't started investigating, I wouldn't have had that sighting because I wouldn't have been here. Yeah, so it's very, very interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I think the dedication it takes to follow something up year after year, still seeking evidence still seeking uh, the truth of the subject is is something that only a few individuals possess and it takes a lot of guts and um the one thing uh, not w wishing to awkwardly compliment you but the one thing a lot of researchers tell me constantly is scott is in it for the the truth he shares his evidence everybody gets something of scott if they want to know some information about something, some, some, what's the evidence of this, what's the history of that, speak to Scott and he'll tell you. And that's something all of, the, all of us have um, benefited from. So we thank you for that. You know, it's a very... Well, thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. It, it mm. makes me feel like, you know, that I haven't been wasting my time, you know? Well, exactly. And that is passing down the information that's been, that's been learned and that's been gathered. Yeah. And that's how things it, traditionally in society are supposed to happen. You know, yeah. those who have learned something, pass it on. And um, I certainly have, um, have gained a lot of knowledge. The only thing, thing I want to emphasize to people is that as well known as I am as an archival researcher, I'm very much a field researcher. Uh -huh. And maybe I don't come back with as much sensational evidence as a lot of field, so-called field researchers do. But I'm trying to be especially critical and 
put scrutiny on what I consider to be evidence in order for it to be acceptable by skeptics. That's right. That's right. So you're not going to see me trying to pass off a bunch of fish recordings as the sounds of champ or videos and photographs of standing waves and boat wakes as champ. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I think that's important as well. And longevity, yeah. I believe in this, in this field, longevity is based upon that. If you make something up, you'll shorten your days drastically. If you yeah. um, present, if you be, if you're your own worst skeptic, I used to say to myself, yep. what were the skeptics? What hard why time would they give you about this, Andy? Why them to do it to you, you when find? you can do it yourself? Yeah, exactly. They exactly. cut out the middleman, you know? But this is it. Cut out the middleman. If you can be them. I try to think of the worst of them. And by the worst, I mean the most um, clinically, the most clinically minded skeptic. What would they think of this? And uh, would I get it past them? And if you can get like a 70%. That's good enough for me. I think that's a 70% pass. I'll post that. Yeah. That's yeah. okay. Unless you're asking the question. That's different. What do you think this is? What are your thoughts? But then there's got to be a limit to that too. There's the page that, the Zombie Plessy Source Society page, which I've learned so much from, but also I have the little Nessie and Friends page on the side. Very regularly, I just, that everything needs approval. I just decline tons of posts. because I think that's not relevant. That's not good. This yeah. is, this is lowering the level of the page, and it may not get us as many members, well, but they'll be true members. Emphasizing quality over quantity. Absolutely. Every time. <clears throat> Every time. Well, as far as is possible. And, um, you know, I think the, on the Zombie Plus Source Society, what you see there is a, a range of um, dedicated researchers who've done their homework <clears throat> discussing, you know, discussing the topic and debating the evidence very that... rarely have i had to eject a skeptic mm. from the group i'm usually pretty pretty lenient yeah but there have been a couple of times when they just you know kept trying to ram their views down people's throats that didn't agree with them mm -hmm. and i asked them to back off i asked them to back off and back off and they just wouldn't do it and i finally had to remove them yeah, because they just yeah. would not do it. I've done one or two, but you know. Yeah, I've done one or two lately, which is maybe a bit sad. But it's um, it's more the tone than anything else. You That's can disagree with people. It's not without... so much what you say as yeah. how you say it. Yeah. That, Look, a lot of the time, that's the whole problem. Yeah, I understand how people get heated in the early days of sort of getting more involved in this. I remember having many. on that page with, with people and coming from a very believer type perspective and then looking back on those texts and those arguments later and thinking gosh that's embarrassing what are you fighting for you just disagree and actually the best thing to do when you when you cannot find any point to, to agree with somebody is just to not have the conversation because it's a useless conversation that leads leads to yep. conflict it's you both stated your point three interactions yep. three interactions and then out out and that's well, be my <laughs> I would say that in the almost 28 years uh -huh. of investigating this phenomenon the three most significant things that have happened to me personally were one my 1994 sighting 2016 I was here with the Japanese and I talked them into going over to split rock the 400 foot mm. depths and put the underwater camera down with bait, salmon, and we got a video of some kind of appendage coming up to touch mm. the bait. I remember that. Then in July of 2017, something swam under Will's boat and we got it on the sonar, this blob. I call it the blob. Mm. Those are the three most significant things that have happened to me. Probably if I wanted to add a fourth, was be, would be working with Liz von Muggenthaler and uh -huh. sitting on the beach in 2009, listening to the echolocation type clicks that she recorded in 2003. But we were listening to these live. Mm -hmm. 
in 2009. So that would be the most significant things that have happened to me personally in this whole hunt. So I think it's um it's a wonderful way to spend your day, you know. And it's um and if you can do it, um, keep that passion going, then that's you know more power to you. Um, just just to before we sort of pop off, just to, to fill us in, what's the, what's the plan for the rest of your journey? Um, well, obviously you're getting out on the boat, but um, you, well, you on the raft, sort of, I don't really uh-huh. have a boat at this point, but uh-huh. um, toward the end of my stay, Nash Huber and Alexander uh, Petikov are supposed to come up okay. and film an episode for um, Chasing Legends. Yeah, for Chasing Legends, yeah. and I'm going to be involved in that, presumably. Oh, that's fantastic. And then I'm, I'm going to go various places. There's a place that was closed last year called Colchester Causeway uh-huh. that I want to put down an underwater camera with glow sticks, which is an artificial mm-hmm. form of illumination that doesn't require a power source. Mm-hmm. Divers use them all the time. So I want to put one of those down on either a fishing line or a rope and see if something comes up to investigate. Wow. And I've got the drone camera. I also want to go back to the caves near Marble Island Marina on Cave Island. That's the cave you see me swimming to in the video. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go in there with the raft and get photographs of the inside of the caves. And also dig around in the bottom in the mud in the bottom looking for bones right. that might be left over from the Ice Age, from okay. the Champlain Sea period. Okay. Oh, so. hopefully even recently. Yeah. <laughs> See. Even recently. Yeah. Um, I I think it's 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 fantastic, and I envy you. I I wish I was there, and it, it's good to see you healthy and happy. Well, and getting you down to what I have to do over the next two or three days, putting all this crappy equipment <laughs> together. I hate this. Well, you're lucky I'm not there. So I'm not I'll be there so happy help. when it's done. I can go out and play with it. You know, yeah. I don't have to put it together. You know, what you need to do is um, you need to get out there on the beach with it uh, and sort of set up near some sort of handy looking guys and then start struggling in front of them. They wouldn't be able to wait to get over there and, and help somebody out. You know how guys are sometimes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, as I said earlier, I want to be especially careful in this raft. If I've got yeah. this $400 sonar unit in it, mm. I don't want nothing to happen to it where I lose the sonar unit mm. and lose myself at the same time. That's very true. So the, the plan is to specific, to very strategically go to places where I can access deep water right off the shoreline. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Or if I've got to go somewhere nearby, get in as close as I can possibly get to it to where I don't have to do a lot of traveling out in the the mid part of the lake to get to it. Yeah. No, you need that. And this is really, I mean, this is really grassroots study as well. You know, you you don't have the boat anymore. You're going up there. You're taking yourself out on a dinghy in a light jacket with a harpoon and a sonar unit. You know, I still... Mourn the loss of William Jorginus. Yeah. And when Will was alive, we had the equipment we needed. But unfortunately, he died. And all that equipment had to go to pay for his medical bills. Yeah, of course. So anybody, reasonable person, would would understand that I'm having to reboot here. Well. But I'm slowly I, making it back, you know? I think what I'm saying is, this is this is hardcore. You're doing yeah, the work. Yeah. You're not put off by the fact that you've got to get out there on the water in a dinghy with a sonar unit and a harpoon and a drone and a life jacket on. This is hardcore yeah. study. Well, I want people to understand the nature of that harpoon. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to throw it like Captain Ahab. Mm-hmm. What it is, it's a pole with a biopsy dart on the mm-hmm. end of it. And the plan is, is that if a champ was to get close enough for me to reach out and touch it, which is one in a million possibilities. Mm -hmm. I could take that pole and gently reach over and get a small tissue sample. And they use the same technology in whale and shark research Mm -hmm. 
all the time, <clears> totally <throat> harmless. It just gives you a little piece of tissue sample. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic. Now, there's somebody out there that has been telling people that, oh, he's going to go out with this harpoon and harpoon champ, <laughs> which is a load of BS. So hopefully that straightens that question out. Well, let's put it this way. If you should have that one in, in a million chance to, to take a, a biopsy sample from a champ and it was a harpoon that you harpooned it with, it wouldn't you wouldn't do too well from that situation anyway, from that encounter in a dinghy harpooning a twenty five foot. Yes, I understand um, that, but creature. I'm willing to take that chance. I know, but what I'm saying is if if somebody is worried about you hurting and harpooning champ, mm. I think they should be more worried about what happened to you afterwards. Uh, whereas with the biopsy down, at least you have a chance. Um, look, I think the most important thing about all of this is is that um, you know, you're there and you're doing your work, and we all know that we're going to benefit from it. Whatever's discovered, we're going to find out. The crash yeah. course guys have well, got their documentary. Then I uh, have chasing legends believe. guys have theirs too, and um, and that will preserve you know what you're doing and uh, and just keep spreading the word because I think Lake Monster yeah. Research is amazing, and it just needs. It, it should easily be as big as uh, Bigfoot research. You know, it's so interesting and it's so well, fantastic. You know, I uh, I think anybody serious about this realizes that the only way you're ever going to break through the wall is with physical evidence. Mm -hmm. You get physical evidence of one of these animals, either through a tissue sample or you find bones of ones that's already dead. You can prove they exist without having to harm or kill one. Mm. And then, if, if they're officially recognized as real animals, they will be given full protection like they any will. other bear animal. Mm -hmm. Instead of these, you know, these uh, laws that are on the books now that are protecting an imaginary animal. Mm -hmm. mm. They have about as much teeth as a, a law protecting unicorns and mermaids. Oh, yeah. So we've yeah. got to get over that hump. And anybody that is trying to discourage that, I believe is more interested in promoting themselves and exploiting the mystery for years and years to come, leaving it open-ended simply for want of attention for themselves as some kind of expert or whatever it is. You well, know? I think, yeah, it's a zoological issue, isn't it, really? We, if... <laughs> The, the consensus should be that it is a living, real animal. And if that is proven to be true, then yes, we want... Unless you want to go the paranormal route, which is a cop-out, I think. I I think that's like... So, I'm nothing against the paranormal guys, but I'm interested in zoology. I'm interested in animals. That's my primary concern. And similarly uh, to yourself, I think when you go the paranormal route, I think that's the human ego saying, I can't find it, therefore it must be something supernatural because I failed to get it, or we failed to find it. It's and almost it removes like the, the burden of evidence from you, too. You can't collect any evidence about that. You can't. It's a I ghost. Mean, yeah. You know, you're not going to get a tissue sample. Well, I remember ectoplasm. an article coming out about the some of the alleged pterosaur sightings had been in the Pennines in England and I, I, I actually don't remember who wrote it but they said ghosts of dinosaurs this is probably ghosts of dinosaurs that's more likely than there being some sort of living pterosaur species that occasionally passes through the UK my thoughts were all right get out there could... with an EMF meter use the yeah. same tools the ghost hunters use they exactly. come back with evidence exactly. allegedly exactly but for me it was such an implausible standing to say that they would be one that dinosaurs would have ghosts two that that they would be here in the uk and instead of it just being a real animal and it that kind of stretch that skeptical stretch sometimes when the um when the denial becomes more implausible than the actual subject they're denying it's strange it's so strange yeah. that, sure well, it's very unlikely that there are still living pterosaurs rather than ignore the paranormalist I've tried to engage them in conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Just ignoring them is not going to do anything good. Well, it's not only that. Sometimes they've collected evidence. Try selling that to the biologists that you're trying to win over that, oh, there may be an unknown species. Yeah, exactly. Well, Let's write a law protecting this unknown species, but it might be paranormal and come in and out of dimensions. Yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> 
Well, there's listen, all kind of pitfalls to the whole argument. There you know? is, there is, and until we know either way, I guess we just don't. We'll never have that. that yeah, final everybody's word. entitled to their opinion, you know. That's true. That's true. I'm just and, keeping uh, in mind, you know. I agree with that. My personal philosophy is: I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. You yeah. Know? Um. That's that's uh. I know enough to know I don't know enough. Um, Scott, I'm going to let you go. And, uh, you know, wish you the best, absolute best of luck uh, over this thing. And we're really, really hoping for something, whatever that is, and that you're safe, you stay see. safe on the water. Um, if something uh, happens, you will hear about it, I promise. Yes, yes. Well, I, I, I hope to not have to eulogize you, but um, I, I will be praying for your safety and... Uh, and also success. Well, I got to get home because I miss my wife and my kitty cat. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You'll be back. You'll be back yep. for sure. Well, buddy, thanks so much for stopping and talking to us. Good luck. Yep. Okay. Have a good one. Thanks. Have a great Bye. trip. Bye-bye.